southern Nevada. Um, so this is an old shower pipe. It's basically uh, solid copper. Pretty good, pretty good solid, solid copper. Yeah, um, I got a bunch of thinner ones that are actually really fun. And uh, I'm going to drop something down. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Um, here we go. Ready? Uh, you know, I'll come over here so you can see what's going on. Bring this one too. Down, down the uh, anyone have any idea why it's taking so long to go down there? Is it because the copper is like kind of pushing against the magnet itself because of the electron the electromagnetic field? So it's kind of like it's not pure gravity going down, it's the copper pushing on the magnet, slowing down the force of gravity. In a sense, I guess. You're floating around it. Yeah. So there's definitely something that's acting against gravity. Um, so it's like boop. So if I if you notice, like on the way out here, it'll fall pretty fast once it leaves the pipe. Yeah. So it falls plenty fast once it leaves the pipe, but when it's in the pipe, it goes pretty slow. Huh. It's spinning in the pipe. It's not actually. <clears throat> um, it's kind of it's kind of dancing around, do, 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 dancing around, but it's not spinning in the pipe. It's falling straight down. And I will leave this. If you promise not to bend the pipe, and it's not a lightsaber or a javelin, then I will leave it over here for uh, for you guys to play with later on. Um, oh, um, by the way, oh, right, it's not plugged in. Sorry, this is, this is not being recorded. Um, <coughs> copper, not magnet. Steel. Copper. And that's a pure copper shaft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out that the EMI that I've been experiencing is, is, is more prevalent than before. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> oh, did he report in the, uh, the generator no. interrupting the camera? Oh, yeah, I talked talk to the guy. Um, by the way, I still don't have some of your forms. So those forms I gave you, you get those signed. Remember those forms? That you said you the next day. Yes, and you're like, I'll get those, I promise. Still don't have them. So get those in. Uh, okay. I'll have to check. Uh, I got a stack of them over there. Okay, uh, so we're talking about electromagnetism. And uh, it's really interesting why things do what they do. And lots of what you encounter in real life are due to this crazy phenomenon that Hans Christian Orsted came up with, or demonstrated, that moving electrons create magnetic fields. And magnetic fields can cause electrons to move. So that's the, that's the bulk of electromagnetism, why it is actually called electromagnetism. A uh, hundred years ago, there was magnetism, and there was electricity. And then it took a while, we realized, oh, that's just two sides of the same coin. So we call it electromagnetism. And uh, so spinning or moving atoms with all our electrons create magnetic fields. So moving electrons create magnetic fields. And magnetic fields can cause electrons to move. And then this is something that you should be thinking about. We're not going to, much, much like the pipe, I'm not going to answer it right away, but you're going to, it'll develop as we go. What do traffic lights, or how do traffic lights and vending machines, what do they have in common? What do traffic lights and vending machines have in common? Besides they work, both work on electricity. Okay, any questions before we jump right in? Okay. So let's see. If, boop. There we are. <laughs> okay, so we've all seen magnets, right? Yes. Typical bar magnets. A bar magnet has a north pole and a south pole. And the north pole attracts the south pole, and the south pole attracts the north pole. Just like with electric charges, opposites attract, likes repel. Makes sense, right? Yeah. So um, magnets have north pole and south pole. They didn't make it positive and negative. They need to make it something. So I said north and south. Why not, right? The Earth is a giant magnet. So why not call them magnets north and south poles? Um, what would happen if you took a bar magnet and you cut it in half? Oh, yes. Like how the poles change? Yeah. If you cut it in half... You have your typical bar magnet, and you cut it in half. Would you have, which of these seems more likely? Um, would you have a magnet that is south-south and another one that is north-north? No. I'm just thinking of the time I've shattered a magnet. Or would you have a magnet that is south-north and another one that is also south-north? Or would they repel each other? Would you have two magnets and one of them is south-north and the other one is north-south? Or would you not have a magnet at all? What do you think is most likely? Wait, every time I've, like, I've had a bar magnet in the world. Mm -hmm. When I try to put it back together, they repel each other. They're in the same spot, I think. This was a long time. I happen to have lots of pieces of, of magnets. Lots and lots of pieces of magnets. When you break a magnet in half, turns out you just get two new magnets. And the reason that is, is if you were to zoom in on the magnet, zoom in at the molecular level on the magnet, what you would find is that some of the material is aligned lined up, and the electrons are spinning the same direction. It's kind of a weird deal because there's so much weird quantum going on. Electrons don't physically spin, but uh, they're energy. But we basically say that electrons in magnetic material have domains of atoms that are aligned. Domains are piles or bunches of atoms. And in magnetic material, the domains are aligned. They're lined up. In unmagnetized material, the domains are random. And again, 
domains are just bunches of atoms. And not all material has what we call permanent magnet ability or ferromagnetism. The big ones are right in the middle of the periodic table. Iron, cobalt, and nickel. Those three chilling out in the middle of the periodic table are the ones we usually think of as being magnetic. Now, there's a bunch of rare earths in the bottom F block of, of the periodic table um, that make up with the new ones like samarium and neodymium. But generally, it is those iron, nickel, and cobalt ones that have domains that can be aligned. Now, that also is why I can take a non-magnetic bolt, a non-magnetic steel bolt, that's clearly non-magnetic, and I can stick a magnet on it and turn it into a magnet. So the magnet will stick to it, and now that I've stuck a magnet to the bolt, the bolt itself becomes magnetic. Yeah, without the magnet, no dice. With the magnet, now the bolt's a magnet. And the reason that is, is the domains that exist can cause other domains to align. Now I can't do that with a plastic straw. If I put the magnet on a plastic straw, you're like, no, plastic can't be magnetic. So you know this, even though there's molecules in the plastic straw, those molecules cannot be aligned. Whereas the molecules in the iron bolt they can be a, they can be a one. Clear? So the words we use are domains, magnetic domains, and with non-magnetized materials, the domains are random. With magnetized material, they are aligned. Okay, how do you make a magnet? This is really how a magnet is made. You simply allow the domains to move. Is all matter moving? Yeah, probably. Even the molecules in this bolt? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're moving. They're just not moving very much. If you want to get them to move really fast, what are you going to do? Melt. Yeah. So you get the non-magnetized material. Oh, no, not again. No. Let's press your button. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Anyway, um, to... My animation just disappeared. Okay. So to make a magnet, you subject your non, your magnetizable material, non-magnetic material, to a strong magnetic field, preferably when the metal is nice and soft, like pretty close to its melting point, and it forms a magnet. Those domains line themselves up, and then when the material hardens, it they stay lined up. And how do you unmake a magnet? Yeah, melt it or bang it. Basically, do something to re-randomize domains and you will unmake your magnet. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, question. I'm assuming we'll get to this later on, but mm -hmm. is there, a, what's the explanation on why some magnets are stronger than others? If it's not covered right now. Density of their domains. Okay. So if you just have pure iron, pure iron has very high density domains, but it's not all that uh, it's not all that good for industry because it'll rust, it'll corrode. It's kind of soft. Iron's actually kind of soft. Um, so you make alloys that give it the properties you want. Now with the these crazy strong neodymium magnets, you might have heard of rare earth magnets or neodymium magnets. They're usually super shiny because they're painted. They're painted with a, an enamel. And the reason they're painted with an enamel is they are crazy soft. You could drop this or snap. You could actually probably take this one and snap it in your finger. It's it's about the it's a little bit stronger than a sweet tart. So they put it in an enamel. But it is an alloy that neodymium added to the iron and samarium makes it very, very, very magnetic, very, very dense in their domains. Okay. Yeah. So that is why. Okay, so we've gotten through the uh, the third and fourth grade curriculum. We can move on. Any questions before we move on? Okay, moving on. 
So how do you induce a magnet? Well, you just, and actually we're still a little bit third or fourth grade left to do. To induce a magnet, you just put a thing that can have magnetized material in a magnetic field and the domains will line up. Okay. And that's what's going on with my pile of uh, paper clips. Let's put a strong magnet in there and it'll stick all the magnets together all the paper clips together, and now the domains will actually align, and one will induce a magnet in the next one, and the next one, and the next one. The mag magnetized domains get induced, and that's the word we use, induced. Induced is basically to make something happen. Ah, I like a little magnet. I like your magnet. Sweet bolt. Hey, bolt. Okay, now magnets have magnetic field lines. These magnetic field lines point out and in, just like charges. If you remember electric charges, their positive charges point out, negative charges point in, and they have field lines. So if you were to draw uh, electric fields, you have a positive charge, it has field lines that point out, and a negative charge has field lines that point in. Well, magnetism works the same way. The difference is you can't have a monopole. In other words, you cannot have just a North Pole. You cannot have just a South Pole. You must have both poles. Okay. With a positive charge, you can have just a positive charge floating around. With a negative charge, you can have just a negative charge floating around. But with a magnet, you cannot have a monopole. If you have a North Pole somewhere, you have to, it has to be connected somehow to a South Pole. So... North poles, their magnetic lines point away. South poles, their magnetic lines point in. And then if you can imagine all the North poles pointing in every direction, that's where you get uh, this kind of action. Where here's, imagine this is like a bar. This is a positive charge and a negative charge, and you could put this in a bar, and then you're gonna see these field lines. We're gonna do that tomorrow in lab. It's gonna be fun. We're going to uh, shake iron filings and over a bar magnet and see how the magnetic fields line up. So if you uh, put a little piece of metal that is able to spin freely into a magnetic field, those little pieces of metal will line themselves up with the magnetic field in the field lines. Whether they be a tiny diamond uh, made of steel or little flecks of steel or iron, um, they line themselves up. You're going to see this tomorrow when we do this in life. Okay, now we're going to talk about magnitudes. And there's some math coming up too, of course. The math in this is pretty pretty exotic, but uh, when we get past that low-level magnet stuff. Okay, so magnetic fields. Um, we say field strength varies directly with magnetic strength, which should make sense. You double whatever's creating the magnetic field, it's going to double its strength. And magnets can be, or magnetic fields can be created by current. You saw this with a D cell battery, right? When you made the electromagnet, the current went zoom, 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 around and around and around and around and around and around. And the magnetic field was, by the way, up and down the axis of the magnet or axis of the bolt. That's why you were able to pick up paper clips. Yeah. Isn't that technically a short circuit though of the battery? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's uh because the the wire is the only thing that's that's getting in the way for yeah, any kind of resistance. Yeah. And it's not a lot, so yes. That's why, uh, if you notice, the ends, the, the wire gets really, really warm because you are short-circuiting that battery. If we did it with a 9-volt, your electromagnet would last about like five minutes before that battery burned itself out. So that's why we use a D-cell. D-cells take a long time to burn themselves out while you're shorting them out, but they do still warm up because you are shorting out that circuit. Okay. Okay. Um, so you've doubled the current. You're going to double the strength. If we used two D cell batteries back to back, we would have found that we would pick up more paper clips because you'd get more uh, electromagnetism and the wire would get even hotter, dangerously hot. And it also varies inversely with distance. In other words, if you have a certain magnetic strength at one meter away, at two meters away, it's weaker. And it turns out it's, if you double the distance, it's a fourth as strong. It's called the inverse square law. 
something we'll be using, we'll be talking about when we do light and quantum in the next unit. The inverse square law says if you go twice as far away, the strength will be one fourth as much. If you go three times as far away, the strength will be one ninth as much. If you go eight times as way, a far away, the strength will be one sixty fourth of the original strength. Clear? Yes. That's why they call it the inverse square law. It falls off inversely with a square of the distance. Okay. Now, now we're into now we're into tenth and eleventh grade, or well, into high school level uh, magnetism. For this, you require a right hand. Does everyone have a right hand? If you have a right hand, hold it up. Okay. Right. Don't get those mixed up. You're going to get the question, test question wrong. Okay. Now with your right hand, do this. Hold. That's like you're going to be uh, hitching a ride. All right? All right. So here's the thing. You had a bolt. There's your bolt. And your bolt had current going around it with your right hand. The magnetic field was down. This is called the first right-hand rule. And yes, it's a real thing. The first right-hand rule tells you if you have current traveling in the curvature of your fingers, the magnetic field it will produce is straight down. It also tells you this. If you have current traveling in a straight line, the magnetic field will curve around it. So I'm going to use my very cool prop. Imagine this is a copper wire, and electrons are going down the wire. Actually, conventional current is going down the wire. Remember, what's the charge of conventional current? Positive. Yeah, conventional current is positive. Again, we're at that weird place in circuits and current where we talk about charges moving, and conventional current is positive, even though the electrons are actually moving. So positive charge. So we have a positive charge cruising down the wire. Right hand, line up our thumb with the direction of the current, and we fold our fingers around. If current is going down the wire, right hand, then the magnetic field is traveling around it in this orientation. So if the current is going right at you, then the magnetic field is spinning around this way. Make sense? Make sense? Yeah. So that's called the first right-hand rule. If the current is going up, then the magnetic field is going around. And to show the three dimensions of electromagnetism, because electromagnetism has three dimensions, we use a dot, that means coming out at you, and a X means going into you or in, away from you. So it's like the fletching of an arrow, the, the feathers on the arrow. Imagine an arrow is flying away from you, you would see an X. Imagine an arrow is coming at you, you'd see a dot. So something that is out of the plane is a dot. Something that is into the plane is an X. So far, so good. So for this wire here, it is out of the plane on this side, but then into the plane on this side. So for this wire here, it is out of the plane on the left side, this wire in the middle, out of the plane on the left, into the plane on the right. Feel free to use whatever hand gestures you want. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. And when, when you take electromagnetism, whether it be, uh, Actually, we don't offer physics AP. So uh, when you're in college, you're taking electromagnetism, and everyone's doing the test. You're going to be like in the lecture. People are going to be doing this. And then they'll like turn around. And... Totally normal. It's a lot of fun. You just see see uh, college level sophomores and juniors doing E and M electromagnetism, and they're like all doing these crazy hand gestures. And if you didn't know what was going on, you're like, are they signaling to each other? No. 
they're figuring out or they're figuring out magnetic fields and electric fields. So that's the first right hand rule. So a magnetic field is given the letter B and it's measured in Teslas. Some people say Tesla, like Kelvins, and they just say 350 Kelvin. Some people say 1.2 Tesla. Some people say 1.3 Teslas. I don't care. I don't even know which, which one's the best. Um, so if you have a flow of conventional current, then the magnetic field it creates goes around and around. The actual magnitude, here's your formula. The actual magnitude of the magnetic field that is created is based on primarily the current and then whatever is getting in the way of the magnetic field. In this class, the magnetic field will always be made in air or a vacuum. So we use what's called the vacuum permittivity constant, which is 1.6 times in the negative 6 Tesla meter per ampere. <clears throat> so if you had one ampere traveling down a wire, that one ampere would create a magnetic field equal to, in strength, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 6 times 1 divided by 2 pi r. Why 2 pi r? Is that because the magnetic field is in a circle, so we need to use the formula for yeah. a circle? Exactly. You have to use the formula for a circumference based on radius. Yeah. yeah, 2 pi r is the formula for a circumference based on radius. So you're basically saying the bigger your circumference, Remember, denominator gets bigger, the weaker your magnetic field is. In other words, if R is very large, B is very small. If R is very small, B is very big. So very close to the source of the current will have a small denominator, a small circumference about which the magnetic field travels. A very large R will have a very weak, a very large circumference and a very weak magnetic field. Is that clear? That's why the 2 pi r is there, because it is a circle that travels around and around, and the bigger that circle is, the weaker the magnetic field is. If you are clear with, if you're with me so far, give me a thumbs up. We are, we are in the, we are in it now. All right, so first right hand rule shows the direction of the magnetic field around a current carrying wire. We use magnetic to keep uh, this from happening too. So we can also use permanent magnets to interfere with the magnetic field that is created from current carrying wires. My interest right now, my, my puzzle, is why does the USB keep kicking out? Like, why does it have to keep happening? Let's see if the USB is even working. So the USB connected to the camera, it happened a few times earlier today, and it happened a whole bunch when we were using the generator. Why does it keep kicking out? OK, we're good so far. Um, and the reason, my current theory, the reason it's kicking out is there is electromagnetic interference. When we ran the generator, the generator created magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields interfered with the magnetic fields in the USB. That's why there's those little rectangles. See the little rectangle on the USB cable? Yeah. That little, oh, sorry, rectangle, cylinder. See the little cylinder on the USB cable? That cylinder is a permanent magnet. And that magnet attempts to cancel out the magnetic, magnetic field that is created when the current travels through the wire. It's called a choke, also called a ferrite. Ferrite's an old name for a magnet. OK, how are we doing so far? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me. Wave your hand around if you want to talk, some, talk about us more. All right. All right, so. Um, Back to this. When current creates a magnetic field, it goes around and around, right angle to the flow of the, of, the, of, the, of the current. But here's something really weird. If you send a current through a magnetic field, it will attempt to be deflected. It doesn't want to be in that magnetic field. So it experiences a force. So magnetic fields will deflect charged particles and current carrying wire. And to do that, we use the second right-hand rule. OK. Wait till you uh, scribble. Some of you are scribbling. You need your right hand for this. Okay, so before, 
This was the first right-hand rule. You have a current going that way, the magnetic field goes around and around. Here's the next one. I have to warn you, there's lots of different interpretations with the second right-hand rule. Um, the vast majority of them online are not what I'm going to teach you, but there's a reason I'm going to teach you this particular version of the second right-hand rule. Okay, take your hand like this. Okay, Curl these fingers halfway so you're like this. Exactly. Now everybody shoot wide. So you shoot your charged particles. This is why I do it this way. And the reason I do it this way is you shoot your charges through your finger, whether they be positively charged particles or conventional current, your fingers are the direction of a magnetic field and your thumb is the direction of the deflecting force. Okay? So your finger is shooting charged particles. Pew, 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 pew. Your three fingers are the direction of the magnetic field. And I'll tell you why we use three here in a second. And your thumb is the direction of the deflecting magnetic force. <laughs> this is going to make perfect sense when we actually go through it. So fingers, current flow, or charge velocity. Now, um, there's something we need to talk about, these two formulas. These formulas are the exact same formulas. Q is charge in coulombs. V is velocity. B is magnetic field. <coughs> F equals QVB. And by the way, these are all vectors. So what you're actually, by the way, what you're learning right now is a cross product of vectors. Have you done vector cross products in, uh, in pre-calculus yet? Yeah, you will. You're going to do vector pro cross product eventually. Um, and then F equals BIL. F is force. B is magnetic field strength. I is current. And L is length. And let me show you how why or how it is that these two formulas are exactly the same thing. How about yellow? Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to put it on the whiteboard so you have more space. So one formula is F equals QVB. Q is coulombs. What is the charge of, or what is the unit for coulombs? Sorry. Q is charge, and coulomb is C. V is velocity. Velocity is meters per second. And B is teslas. Right? Okay. So, and then we have F equals B I L. B is Teslas, I is amperes, and L is meters. But you said these are the same. Just wait. What is the definition of an ampere? Anyone remember? Yeah. Isn't it out of coulombs per second? Exactly. One ampere is charge over time, or one coulomb for one second. So this becomes Tesla coulomb per second meter. Can you see that they are the same? So whether you have a positively charged particle traveling through a magnetic field, or a current carrying wire in a magnetic field, it is going to experience a deflecting force as long as, this is critical, the current and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. Now, the reason I did not put sine theta after these two, and you're technically, it should, there should be a sine theta, sine theta. The reason I didn't put a sine theta in the, between these two is in this class, they will always be exactly perpendicular or parallel. If the charge and the magnetic field are parallel, the force will be zero. If the charge and the magnetic field are perpendicular, the force will be QVB or BIL. Okay. I did not put the sine theta after that because in physics one, everything is perpendicular or parallel. If they're parallel, 
force is zero. If they're perpendicular, force is BIL or QVB. Okay. Vibrating power poles or vibrating power lines. What noise does a vibrating power line make? A buzz. A buzz. Or not. Some power lines are completely silent. Some buzz. If you remember, if you remember before, what is the uh, what is the speed or the frequency at which AC current goes back and forth? Do you remember the frequency of AC current? Well, like ridiculous amount every second. In this continent, sixty hertz. Current's going back and forth, it's like back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, sixty times a second. Well. If the civil engineers put the wires perpendicular to the magnetic field of the Earth, guess what happens? When the current goes that way, there's a magnetic force that pushes the cable up. And then 1 60th of a second, the current's going that way, pushing the magnetic force or pushing the cable down. 1 60th of a second. It's going that way, the force goes up. 60 to the second, current goes that way, the force goes down. And what happens if some if a wire goes up, then down, then up, then down, then up, and down? Exactly. You get a guitar string. Boom. The frequency of that buzz, if they if the civil engineer happened to be dumb enough to put the wires perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field, is 60 hertz, like a 60 hertz guitar string. Boom. That's what's happening. The wire is bouncing up and down 60 hertz, 60 times a second. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Just like a guitar string at 60 hertz. Boom. Now, if the, the civil engineer knew what he was doing, or she, and put the wires parallel to the Earth's magnetic field, guess what happens? It starts with an N and ends in theme. Nothing. Yeah. If you have your current traveling parallel with the magnetic field, there is no magnetic force. Perpendicular, QBB and BIL. The power lines near my park, they, they're pretty loud buzzing. That's probably fine. It's, it's, it's annoying. It doesn't hurt you at all. The exact, same, uh, the exact same electric field and magnetic field that exists on a perpendicular line and a parallel line, exactly the same field, it's just one is experiencing, experiencing magnetic force, and the other's not. So people are like, I don't like that buzz. It's probably giving me cancer. No more than your television is. Actually, far less. Okay, so, um, yeah, I hate, hate to break this to you, but uh, magnetic field lines go from north to south. Our south pole is the magnetic north of our planet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so... Yeah, sorry about that. But um, so the South Pole is actually the magnetic north. Um, of, so the field lines run from the south to the north, just like that. Um, but because we have a molten iron and nickel core that is spinning around, that creates a magnetic field around the Earth, which is really good because it creates what's called the magnetosphere. And the magnetosphere shields us from ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is really nasty. It's the reason that, or probably the reason, that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere anymore. Um, so depending on your, your scale of universal time, um, it's possible that Mars once had an atmosphere and a semi-molten core, just like we have a semi-molten core. The problem is when that core hardened, whenever that happened to be, that killed its magnetosphere and the solar winds blew the atmosphere right off the planet. The same thing would happen with us. If our molten core stopped spinning and we were just like a big block, big block we were just a rock spinning around and we didn't have a semi-molten core, then our magnetosphere would shrink and disappear and then our atmosphere would be gone in a couple decades. Plus, we all starved before that because we couldn't grow any food. But anyway, so the magnetosphere actually shields us from solar wind. Kind of a neat deal. Magnetic declination is the difference between our magnetic field in broad sense and our axial uh, our, our axial spin. So I think it's at 27 degrees right now. 
it moves around because like a water balloon kind of wobbles when it spins. The Earth does too. Um, so our that's our um, axial spin, and our magnetic field is about like oh, 11.5, 11.5 degrees. So our axial spin is 27 degrees, and then you subtract 11.5, and that gives us our magnetic magnetic uh, our magnetic poles. That's called declination. It moves all over the place. Yeah. I thought it was really funny that because there's like a bunch of conspiracy theories were like Russia's trying to steal the North Pole. It's funny. It only only moves like a few centimeters uh, every hundred years or so. So not a huge deal, but it does move. Just like if you had a water balloon and you spun a water balloon, it's gonna wobble around. Earth does that too. Okay, this is a good place to end. We're gonna practice. We're gonna practice using right hands. So. Get your right hand ready. Okay. Now, the most important thing you need to remember is what each of the, the things is. Um, when, when I was in college, no joke, I wrote I on this finger and F on this finger and E on these fingers um, just because I didn't want to mess it up. And no matter how well you know it, in the heat of battle when you're taking a test, you can mess it up. So feel free to write an I on your finger or a V and then an F on your thumb and a B on your, your other fingers. So let's take a look at this. If I had current traveling in this direction, up, and I had force traveling in that direction, out, my magnetic field would be out of the plane towards you. Okay, so convince yourself if current, here, if current is up and magnetic force is to the right, then the magnetic field that caused that deflecting force would be would have to be out of the plane towards you. Do you remember how you show out of the plane? It's X. It, the X is the arrows traveling away from you. The dot is the arrows traveling towards you. So you would show it this way. And this is why I like to use three fingers for the magnetic field because the magnetic field is almost always shown with at least three dots. Sorry, at least nine dots or nine X's. It's usually three by three. I made it four by five for emphasis, but you usually show magnetic fields as three by three X's or three by three dots, which is why I like to use three fingers for the magnetic field. I am not in the majority for that. If you look online and you put the second right hand rule, it's going to show you a different system, but you get you get the same you get to the same place. I just like using the three fingers because I'm all about educating the the next generation. I don't care about my views. All right. How are we doing? Ready for, ready for one of your own? What's that? Where's the magnetic field in this case? Do you have an answer or a question? Okay, so first and foremost, before you give me the answer, you only have two options because the force is perpendicular to the current, which means there's only one dimension left. So if you got an a, if you got a, a y, if you have your current in the y and the force in the x, your only dimension is z. So it's either out of the plane or into the plane. Which one is it? Into the plane. How do you show into the plane? With x's. Okay. So your current must be perpendicular to your magnetic field. If it is, there's going to be a deflecting force that is perpendicular to both of them. We're using all three axes. If current and magnetic field are parallel, there cannot be a magnetic deflecting force. So here we go. Draw the third vector, whatever it happens to be. The X's represent the magnetic field, by the way. So we usually, again, typically they're three by three, which is why I use three fingers. So I think it's better than everything else. I can't, I can't explain why other people don't use it that way, but that's, sort of, that's the way I was taught. Way to go, Oregon State University. And that's this is the way I teach it to you. Oregon State University. I want to find out you're graduating here. Uh, 1998. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Good job.
I'm uh, I'm in the I'm in the, the course catalog for 1997 too. Huh. I have a copy of it down there. You see what I look like in 1997? I'll give you a hint. Uh, skinny. <laughs> okay, so uh, what what vector is missing? The the deflecting force. And in what your your only options because their perpendicular is up and down. So which direction is the magnetic, is the deflecting force? Current is to the right. So the only options for magnetic force are the magnetic deflecting force is up and down. So magnetic field is into the plane. Current is that way. So the force be up, yo. Make sense? Let's do another one. We have, um, yeah, we have like six minutes left. So we are showing magnetic deflecting force and we are showing magnetic field. So what direction was the current or the path of positive charges? So the force was down, the magnetic field was into the plane. So the direction of charge movement had to have been to the left. See how this is going? And one left. There's your current. There's your magnetic field. What direction is the magnetic deflecting force? <laughs> yeah, this is a little tricky. I gotta, I gotta kind of tweak yourself into a various directions here. I am a gymnastic business. Looks like most of you are pointing, well, down. Down? Okay, so. The magnetic field is towards you, and the current is towards the right. So the magnetic deflecting force is down. Yeah. How are you feeling about this? It's actually nice. Okay. Questions? So this is what you actually see uh, in, in uh, AC current. The electric field is constantly oscillating between positive and negative and positive and negative. So if the electric field is the red, this is actually kind of a, like kind of hard to see. This is the best, this is the best animation I could find, honestly, which is kind of frustrating. But the magnetic field is always perpendicular to the electric field. And if the electric field is the highest point, the magnetic field that it creates will also be at the highest point. If the electric field is zero, then the magnetic field will also be zero. And again, they have to be perpendicular. You better believe there is a test question that says this magnitude is like this Tesla by this amperes is perpendicular. Then you can do the QVB or VIL. And they say this Tesla is, per is parallel to this current. The answer is going to be zero. It doesn't matter how big the magnetic field is. It doesn't matter what the current is. If they are parallel, the answer is zero newtons. Okay. Now, this was for positive charges. Negative charges, you just reverse the process. You just basically, you flip your thumb around or you use your left hand. Up to you, fun fact, eight years ago, um, the, the valedictorian said, I learned about the right and left hand rules because um, we had this discussion about, should it be the negative of the right hand rule or should it be the left hand rule? Well, the left hand rule is the negative of the right hand rule. I was pretty proud of her. So uh, positive charge travels that direction. The magnetic field is into the plane. It's going to expect, it's going to experience a deflecting force. But here's the thing, watch carefully. As it goes into the magnetic field, it's gonna be deflected up. And it's gonna keep getting deflected up and keep getting deflected up and keep getting deflected up. The path of a charged particle in a magnetic field is a circle. Alexa, cancel. Because if you remember, going back to August or September, if you have a velocity and an acceleration that is perpendicular to the velocity, you form a circle. Yeah. So the force on a particle, do particles have mass? Yes, yeah. even tiny charged particles have mass. Since the force is always going to be perpendicular, that means the acceleration 
will always be perpendicular. And when acceleration is always perpendicular, when acceleration is perpendicular to velocity, you form a circle. So this one is going to make, hey, I can do the green. It's going to make a circle. It's going to look like that. What about this one? Positive charge traveling this direction, but now the magnetic field is coming at you. It's going to form a circle. It's going to look like that. And then electrons. Electrons do the exact opposite of charged particles. So if an electron comes in to a magnetic field, you can move your thumb down or you can use the right hand or the left hand rule. So left hand rule. Yeah. And and thumb down. So this electron is going to be curved away this way in a circle. And this electron is going to curve up in a circle. Why are they circles and not parabolas? Because the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. How are we feeling about this? Feeling good? This is a good place to stop. This is a cool animation that doesn't want to run. Click on it, maybe it'll run. Tap, hey, that's running. Whee! Nope. <laughs> Only running once or just, that's it? I get one shot, oh, there it goes. Nope. So uh, my last question before I release you is, what's the charge of this particle? Nope. Is that an X or a signal? That is a dot. Okay. So the magnetic field is this way. It's traveling upward. Is it a positive charge particle or a negative charge particle? What do you think? I made it bigger. I should like stretch it. You can see it better. So the magnetic field is into the plane. So no, out of the plane. Magnetic field is out of the plane. Out of the plane. The velocity is up. And what direction is experiencing a deflection? So is it positive or negative? Does it work with your right hand or your left hand? Right hand. It's a positive particle. Positive particle. Part of the magnetic field is out of the plane. Direction is up, deflection is to the right. Let's see if we last the whole period. Is it still recording? Hey, it's still recording.